As I began ninth grade in the fall of 1952, Hollywood was in a state of enormous change, if not chaos. The major studios were losing control over the film industry and their stables of stars, producers and directors and writers. My mother called me at school one night extremely upset. She said she had very bad news for me. From the tone of her voice and her choice of words, I thought somebody had died. Then she told me that she had left Warner Brothers. She said that she no longer had a contract, she didn't have a job, and she was almost totally broke. For the first time in my life, I heard the faint glimmer of humility in my mother's voice. She was not her angry self. She sounded embarrassed, frightened, and even apologetic. She'd been in Hollywood more than 27 years, and this was the first time in her career that she didn't have a studio contract. She was totally on her own for the first time since she was 21 years old. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. My mother was scared and I could hear it in her voice. The trauma was still too new, too immediate for her usual defenses to surface and cover up the hurt, the insecurity and the panic. I sensed that she had no one else to turn to and that she needed to talk. A few months later, Mother began work on her first independent film, Sudden Fear. For her performance, Mother received a third Academy Award nomination as Best Actress. She did not win another Oscar, but her career accelerated. Mother's comeback with Mildred Pierce had gotten her a professional reprieve, which was followed two years later by a second Academy Award nomination for Possessed. But with the demise of her Warner Brothers contract, and then the finish of her independent film, she was having to struggle for each and every job. Even with a third Academy Award nomination for Sudden Fear, one picture no longer automatically led to another. She was in her late forties. Perhaps because she was so busy taking care of her personal life, Mother didn't have much time to pay attention to us. Now my brother and I both lived at Chadwick School and didn't go home very often. We didn't get into the trouble that usually followed one of those weekends at home either, so it wasn't such a bad trade-off. One night before dinner at boarding school, I was part of a group standing around the outside patio waiting for the dining room doors to open. Next to me were three or four boys from the 11th grade who were new students that fall. It was impossible for me not to hear what they were saying. I was the topic of their conversation. One boy was telling another that old, tired story about my seventh grade mishap. Only over the years the story had been considerably embellished. My outrage was really the culmination of two years of hassles and sly smiles and lost boyfriends and not being trusted by the faculty. It was two years of fighting for respect and friendship. It was two years of anxiety and frustration and anger that went into my closed fist as I whirled around to face this young man who towered over me. Without a second thought or a moment's hesitation, I carried through with my fist and belted him right in the middle of his stomach. It was so unexpected that he lost his balance, staggered a few steps backward, tripped, and fell into the shallow fish pond. While only the two boys standing next to him had seen me slug him in the stomach, Half the student body witnessed his spectacular plunge into the fish pond. Water splashed everywhere, and several large goldfish went flying out into the patio. Everyone roared with laughter at him as he sat in the middle of the pond, totally drenched and completely bewildered. After a moment, even I laughed. I walked away with a feeling of silent triumph. But I knew I, I couldn't go around punching people when they said something I didn't like or that hurt my feelings. I was getting worn out fighting for every single accomplishment each day of my life. I knew I had to have some help. Then, like an answer to my prayers, I found Walter. Everyone loved Walter. He was captain of the football team and student body president. He was built like a defensive lineman, and nobody argued with him. He may not have been the most handsome man in the senior class, but he was certainly the most respected, the most powerful, and the best liked. When Walter asked me to go steady with him, I accepted happily. I wore his ring on a chain around my neck and took my place among the popular girls. Now, even when I was alone, no one bothered me. When Walter graduated, I didn't know how we were going to keep in touch. I was supposed to come back for summer school, and I told him I'd call him then. I didn't want him to write me at home because my mail was opened and my telephone calls were monitored. When I came home from school, I hated doing the dirty work of the house. I hated being treated like a mute puppet. 
I had to say, yes, Mommy dearest, so many times that the very sound of it nearly made me vomit. She made me call her Mommy dearest now, whether I wanted to or not. And even when I dutifully said, yes, Mommy dearest, I got in trouble anyway for the tone of my voice or the look on my face. It was then that she'd fly into one of her fits of temper and accuse me of doing things I'd never done. Then she'd punish me for the stories she'd made up. If I denied what she accused me of doing, she'd call me a liar and told everyone in the house that she was at her wit's end with me because I lied all the time. No one believed me. It was like living with a lunatic. It was a living nightmare. I guess it was impossible for an adult who had not been present to believe that she was the one who was lying and I was telling the truth. She was always so convincing. She appeared to be so genuinely upset over the situation that she even received a certain amount of sympathy for all her troubles. I was becoming a person with my own ideas and dreams and thoughts about what was right and wrong. At school, we were encouraged to think independently, but that was forbidden at home. At home, you lived by her rules without discussion whether you were her child or her husband or her fan or her servant. In addition, I knew that her drinking was getting worse. Alcohol unleashed so much anger in the woman that it was frightening to be around her. She was never easy to deal with when she was under stress, but when the problem was compounded by her drinking, she was impossible. I thought about the night raids. I thought about the famous movie star with no man and no job who drank herself into a solitary fury and vented her rage on those who couldn't protect themselves. I thought about the drunken arguments, the irrational anger, the fabricated stories and the lies about me. I thought about how excruciatingly ugly and sad it was. During the summer of 1953, when those events were still going on, I only lasted a few weeks at home. With a sigh of relief, I went back to the Chadwick's house after summer school since there wasn't anywhere else for me to go. Walter had come to see me on campus several times during the summer. I guess we were still going together. Toward the end of the summer, he came to see me for the first time at the Chadwick's home to say goodbye before he went away to college. The only other person in the house that afternoon was a thin Japanese woman who worked for the Chadwicks. When she told me that Walter was at the door, I was surprised and delighted. He stayed for about an hour. We sat outside with some iced tea, and he told me all about his future plans. He told me he'd keep in touch with me. I knew I'd miss him very much, and it was nice to hear that he still cared. He kissed me goodbye, and after I walked him to his car, I went back to finish my work. I thought it was absurd that Mrs. Chadwick was angry with me when she found out about Walter's unexpected visit. She said I wasn't supposed to have any visitors without her permission. For once, I stood up to her and said I hadn't asked him to come over. I hadn't opened the door to let him in. It was most unfortunate that my mother called the next night for her weekly report on my behavior. When she learned about Walter, she went into a rage. In no time at all, she was screaming that I wasn't to be trusted and that she was going to have to bring me home since I was causing Mrs. Chadwick so much trouble. After the phone call, I saw Mrs. Chadwick crying. She had not learned to second-guess my mother. This time, she knew she'd been responsible for getting me into trouble. About 10 o'clock that night, Mother showed up in the station wagon with her current secretary as a companion. Since she'd been drinking, at least she had the sense not to drive by herself. Lately, she'd taken to putting her vodka in a plastic water glass filled with ice and drinking while she was driving. Tonight was no exception. I was packed and ready to go. Mother wouldn't speak to me except to order me into the back seat of the car. The next few days were terrible. She wasn't talking to me, so she'd order the secretary or the nurse to tell me what to do. She kept me working 10 or 12 hours a day with no privileges of any kind. Mother had a friend who was visiting Los Angeles from the east, and she'd invited the woman to have dinner with us one night. I was extremely nervous about being in my mother's company for any length of time, particularly in the evening. Dorothy was oblivious to the strained atmosphere and kept chattering away for the duration of dinner. Dinner went smoothly, even though Mother was drinking double vodkas on the rocks. On our way home, Dorothy asked me how school was going. I replied I liked it very much. Then she asked me about one of the students who had been expelled. I relayed that information as diplomatically as I could. With that, Mother turned halfway around to momentarily face me while driving full speed ahead and icily inquired, Who was I to say anything about anyone else since I'd been expelled too? I was so shocked 
that I didn't have an answer for her. What she had said was a total lie. I had not been expelled from school. When we were inside the house, I went to my mother and asked her why she'd said that I'd been expelled when it wasn't true. Mother hauled off and hit me across the side of my head so hard it made my ears ring. She told me that she'd decide what the truth was, and that considering how much I lied, no one believed me anyway, no matter what I said. I was so mad I didn't even cry, although it really hurt. I just stood there staring right back at her, determined I wouldn't give her the satisfaction of seeing one tear. She hit me hard several times again and then stepped back, saying, You love it, don't you? You just love to make me hit you. Only because Mother didn't want her friend to have any peculiar information, Mother called me into the bar to finish our conversation. I followed her into the little room. She sat on the counter and demanded to know why I insisted on arguing with her. I answered that I didn't wish to argue, but that I didn't appreciate her telling people that I'd been expelled from school when it wasn't true. I said I thought she was supposed to be the one who was more understanding, since she was the parent and the adult. It triggered something in her. It struck at some volcanic trauma in the center of her being. She grabbed for my throat like a mad dog, like a wild beast, with a look in her eyes that will never be erased from my memory. I staggered backward, carried by her weight and momentum. I lost my footing and fell to the floor, hitting my head on the ice chest as I went down. The choking pain of her fingers around my throat met the thudding ache of the blow to the back of my head. She banged my head on the floor, tightening her grip around my throat. Her face was only a few inches away from mine, and she was screaming words at me I couldn't even hear. Her mouth was twisted with rage, and her eyes, her eyes were the eyes of a killer animal, glistening with excitement. I gasped for air and felt myself sinking into unconsciousness as I tried desperately to fight back, to free myself. All I could think of was that my own mother was trying to kill me. If someone didn't help me, I was going to die. I tried with the last bit of my strength to struggle free of those choking fingers and managed to wedge one of my knees between her body and mine. I pushed upwards on her ribs with my hands, which loosened her grip. At least it allowed a trickle of air down my throat and kept me from losing consciousness. Now I fought back harder. I didn't want to die. I completely forgot she was my mother. She was trying to kill me, and if I had the strength, I would try to kill her first. She was terribly strong, and all I could do was concentrate on loosening her grip on my throat. The next thing I knew, the new secretary burst into the small room. My God, Joan, you're going to kill her, the secretary yelled. She tried to pull Mother away from me. Though she was also a strong woman, it took some time to separate us. Mother continued to hit me across the face. I felt her ring cut my lip and saw some blood on her hand. Joan, stop! Stop! You're going to kill her! The secretary yelled again. Finally, Mother allowed herself to be pulled away from me and started crying. I lay on the floor trying to catch my breath. My head was throbbing, and I had a hard time swallowing. I raised myself slowly, testing to see if anything was broken. Mother ordered me to go upstairs to the middle room. Somebody would be up there shortly to lock me in. It must have been several hours later when I heard a knock on the door, then a key turn in the lock, and a voice telling me to come downstairs to the bar. When I entered the room, a man I'd never seen before stood up, and Mother introduced him to me as a juvenile officer. I had no idea what a juvenile officer was doing here in the middle of the night. The man asked my mother to leave the room so that he could speak to me alone, and she did not seem surprised by his request. I was still standing in the doorway to the bar, but after she left, the man asked me to come and sit beside him. He looked at me carefully for a long time as we sat silently in semi-darkness. She beat you pretty badly, didn't she? He asked softly. I looked down at the floor and nodded my head yes. I didn't know what she'd told him. I had no way of knowing what I looked like, since the middle room where I'd been locked up didn't have a mirror. Your mother told me her version of the story. Now I'd like to hear yours. I looked at him carefully. He was a man of about 40, plain-looking. His eyes were very direct. He seemed concerned, but not sympathetic, and he looked tired. I related the events as simply and honestly as I could. I said, 
She lied about my being expelled, which was what started the whole argument. When I got to the part about my saying she ought to be more understanding since she was the parent, I looked at him directly in the face and said, that's when she tried to kill me. I added that if it weren't for the secretary, she might have succeeded. When finally he started to speak, it was slow and deliberate. I knew he was choosing his words very carefully. He said that there was nothing he could do to help me. He said that I'd have to try harder to get along with my mother because if she called the authorities again, he'd have no choice but to take me to juvenile hall and book me as an incorrigible. What kind of world was it that allowed mother to nearly murder me and then call me incorrigible? What kind of world was it that always punished me for her insanity? I'm not going to take you to juvenile hall tonight, even though that's what your mother has requested. I had no words. I stared at him, speechless. I couldn't believe this was really happening to me. I'm going to tell her that we've had a talk and that you are going to try harder to get along and not cause any more trouble. But I have to tell you honestly that if she calls again, I'll have to take you down to juvenile hall. I didn't say a word, but tears streamed down my face. It was so clear to me that I was all alone. I had to live with whatever chaos she chose to create whenever she got drunk. I knew this man was trying to be gentle with me, but I hated him and all the others for being too weak to stand up to her. I hated her for what she did to people, for the way she bullied them with her stardom and her influence. I hated the society that allowed this woman to live outside the rules of common decency and the law. Even when they knew she had tried to kill her own daughter, they didn't want to interfere, they didn't want to get involved. I decided that from now on, I would not ask anyone for anything. I would not show anyone how I felt. If I was to be alone in this, so be it. But I would not give anyone the satisfaction of knowing how much it hurt. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. The next morning I went to my own bathroom to wash up. I understood why it took the juvenile officer so long to start talking to me. I had one black eye and a cut on my upper lip which was swollen and covered with blood. My whole face was puffy and I had a perfect handprint bruise across one cheek. A few days later I was on my way back to the Chadwicks. Mother had told them that I was incorrigible and that she couldn't handle me any longer. I was a virtual prisoner now in their home. I wasn't allowed any phone calls or mail or visitors. I had to do extra work as further punishment and wasn't allowed to go anywhere except to church on Sunday. I had been unhappy for so long I couldn't remember being any other way. I did not feel I was a bad person, but I had a terror of being locked up. I retreated as far into myself as I could without losing touch with reality. I lived my life in daydreams. That fall, Mother told the school she was unable to pay full tuition for my brother and me. Therefore, I was put on partial work scholarship, and both Chris and I were expected to work at the Chadwick's house where we lived. I worked in the office at school, too. On Saturdays, we worked all day doing the laundry, cleaning the house and the yard. On Sunday morning, I finished the ironing and then had the afternoon off. The Chadwicks paid me $30 a month for my work, but we received not a penny from Mother, nor did she pay any of our tuition that year. I couldn't figure out where her money went. It certainly wasn't being spent on the two of us. She was making one picture a year, and I knew she also owned an apartment building in Beverly Hills because I had been there with her several times to check on the furnished apartment she kept for herself in the building. During this period of time, I began to get the eerie feeling that Mother was somehow making me relive the penance of her own childhood. Although Mother was paying no tuition for us, we were now all four boarding students at Chadwick. Why she sent us all away to boarding school when she couldn't pay for it, I don't know. We could just as easily have gone to the local public schools. Mrs. Chadwick assured me that she would let me finish out high school even if I had to continue on a total scholarship. I was very grateful to her. She and Commander Chadwick and the school had become my family and my home. I had struggled for a long time. Now I had a real place and a sense of belonging. In addition to recognition for scholastic and acting ability, success had come on the school swim team. 
One of the very best days of my life was at our first big swim meet when I heard the official results booming over the public address system. First place, Crawford, Lane 3. My college entrance exam scores were in the top 10% of the national average, although I was still a junior. Mrs. Chadwick was very pleased, and we began exploratory talks about which colleges would be best. Life had become everything I wanted it to be. I had good grades, good friends, and social acceptance at a school I loved. The week before Thanksgiving vacation in 1954, I called Mother one afternoon to find out if I should take the school bus home that coming weekend. I knew immediately that she was in a foul mood and wished I hadn't called. Just as I was about to say goodbye, she asked about my Christmas card list. Honestly, I had to say that I hadn't even thought about it yet. She launched into a tirade about how thoughtless I was, how disorganized, how sloppy. She started planning Christmas six months in advance, she said. I had known from the moment I heard her voice that it was going to be a precarious conversation. I tried to be polite and brief in order to avoid anything unpleasant, but here it was anyway. She was setting up a confrontation, a fight. I told her that I'd try to have my list made up in the next two days. She said, I'd better have it done tomorrow. Okay, okay, I said, tomorrow. I'll have it done tomorrow. I didn't have to tell Mrs. Chadwick about the conversation because she'd already gotten her own phone call. Things had been going so well that Mother's rage over the stupid list caught even Mrs. Chadwick by surprise. But that night, I sat down and tried to make up an appropriate Christmas card list. When I called her the next day, Mother was still furious with me. She was acting demented. She told me that if I didn't have the right list with all the addresses by the next day, I couldn't come home for Thanksgiving. I was beginning to feel that old sense of hopelessness. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how many months went by smoothly, there didn't seem to be any way to get along with her. That night, she and Mrs. Chadwick and I had a three-way phone conversation that degenerated into a disaster. Even Mrs. Chadwick couldn't hold her temper. Mother was at her very worst, drunk and angry and irrational. She had deliberately caused this whole turmoil, and now she was using it as an excuse to unleash venomous insults at both Mrs. Chadwick and myself. It was the only time I ever heard Mrs. Chadwick raise her voice expressing opposition to Mother. She told my mother to stop swearing at me. Mother yelled at me that she didn't want me home for Thanksgiving or any other time. Fine, I said. That's just fine with me. My reply sent her into a new fit of rage. She accused Mrs. Chadwick of turning me against her. Then Mother dropped the final bombshell. None of us were coming home for Thanksgiving. Even though they had nothing to do with the argument, she was going to make my brother and sisters stay at school over the vacation. I was willing to bet that she never had any intention of having us home for the holiday, and this whole fight was just another of her excuses to blame me for what she wanted to do all along. But then she screamed, after vacation, we were all leaving Chadwick. She would decide later where we were going to be sent, but she was transferring all of us out of that school. I hung up the phone. In that moment, I hated her so much I wanted to kill her. I think I would have tried to kill her if we'd been in the same room. It didn't matter to me that I'd have to spend the rest of my life in jail. Just the thought of being able to rid the earth of her evil would have been satisfaction enough. I hated her so much I was shaking all over. Mrs. Chadwick met me halfway down the stairs. Her face was ashen and I could see her hands shaking. Commander was with her. The three of us sat in silence in the large Spanish living room. It was a cool November evening, and the room had a chill to it. I looked carefully at each of their faces. This was not the usual meeting between us. Commander and Mrs. Chadwick looked different from how I'd seen either of them before. It was as though the three of us were family, and the enemy lurked all around us. The room was in semi-darkness, and no one spoke for a long time. Finally, Commander said in his gruff voice, Tina... I don't know if there's anything we can do to help you, but we're going to try. Mrs. Chadwick was near tears. This is wrong, Tina. It's not your fault. Two days later, it was Thanksgiving. As I looked around the table at my sisters, my brother, and the two elderly people who had come to be my parents, I could hardly imagine life without them. 
I belonged here now. These people loved me. Someone came to take my sisters away from school before the weekend was over. I didn't see them again for almost a year. Next, someone came to take Chris away. The entire time I was helping pack up his things, I felt that this was all my fault, and he was being punished for something he didn't do. During these few days, Commander and Mrs. Chadwick were rarely off the phone. They called half of Los Angeles trying to find a way to keep us in school. I'd even tried to be made a ward of the court released in the Chadwick's custody. I seriously thought about trying to run away, but I knew I'd be hounded until I was caught, and then it might be even worse. So, when I went to bed Saturday night, it was a long time before I could fall asleep. I dreaded what would happen the next day. Late that afternoon, the secretary had called. She would pick me up Sunday. I was to have everything packed. I was going home. I tried again to follow the slim threads of reality through the events of the past week. Each time I ran headlong into an abyss, that black hole where nothing followed logically, where fabrication and anger and turmoil ruled supreme, that place where there was no help and no peace, no escape from the juggernaut of chaos. From her throne in the eye of the hurricane, brandishing her magic wand of obsession, ruled the queen of chaos herself. Mommy, dearest, I could find no reason, no justice, no solace. Powers far beyond my control seemed to have taken possession of my life, my future. I was a being without volition, without a voice in my own existence. I thought about the four years I'd struggled to overcome the shame of my childhood folly with the stable boy. I thought about the hundreds of hours of manual labor and mental anguish. I thought about my slow, gradual, determined climb to a place of respect, trust, admiration, and accomplishment over the past five and a half years at this school. One third of my entire life had been spent with these people in this place. These were the people who loved me, who had spent years helping me, encouraging me to excel, working with me to assure a successful future. The Chadwicks had become my parents and their school my home. At long last, I knew I belonged here. And now, through a chance misspoken word, a few bottles of alcohol and tears, it was all being whisked away. We were all powerless to stop it. Our thoughts, our feelings, our years of hard work were being swept away while we stood by helplessly watching with horror and disbelief. As much as I'd tried to prepare myself for the moment, it came as a terrible shock to see the station wagon had already pulled up in front of the Chadwick house while I was next door saying goodbye to the neighbors. I had one last fleeting urge to run for my life, to run anywhere, to escape this dreadful moment. I saw three people standing by the car, the secretary, the man who was evidently the driver since he wore the cap of a chauffeur, and another man I'd never seen before. Commander and Mrs. Chadwick appeared in the doorway. I knew they were there, but I couldn't face them. I pulled my lips inward and held them between my teeth to keep from crying. I felt immobilized. I couldn't believe this was really happening to me. At last, I turned to face the Chadwicks. I went first to her and put my arms around her. Then I hugged Commander. He was not gruff. He was a kind, middle-aged man who was feeling the pain of a battle lost and the casualty count beginning to come in. He insisted on taking my suitcase. I tried to refuse, but he marched stalwartly back up the long two flights of stairs ahead of Mrs. Chadwick and me. I felt as though I were dying. I think a part of all three of us died that November day. Just before we reached the landing of the second and last floor, Mrs. Chadwick told me that the heavy-set man was a private detective and that he was carrying a gun. I looked at her in astonishment. She said that my mother was afraid there would be trouble. She was afraid that the Chadwicks would interfere with my leaving and she'd ordered this armed guard to accompany us. Mrs. Chadwick whispered to me to be careful and remember they loved me like their own child. We held each other for one last moment. I couldn't stand it any longer. Oh, Mrs. Chadwick, I moaned. My throat ached from trying to hold back the sobbing. Commander put my suitcase in the back of the station wagon. I saw the three hired abductors standing silently around the car. I took another deep breath, pulled myself up straight, 
and walked out of the Chadwick house for the last time. The secretary said something to me which I ignored as I opened the back door of the car and took my seat by the window. The driver and the hired gun got in the front seat. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. My childhood nightmare had come true after all. I really was being kidnapped, complete even to the guns. My childhood terror of that recurrent nightmare swept over me in silence. I knew that wherever these people were taking me, it wasn't home. The car was headed in the opposite direction. At last, I saw a sign that said, Flintridge Sacred Heart Academy, and an arrow pointing to the left fork of the narrow road. We turned and continued until a huge old Spanish fortress-like building came into view. The secretary, the driver, and the hired gun got out of the car, stretching themselves after the long, tiring ride. The driver put down my suitcase just inside the school lobby entrance and told the secretary he'd wait for her in the car. Directly in front of the entrance was an enormous statue of Jesus holding a bleeding heart. I stared at it, horrified. Where was I? I heard a soft voice directly behind me and turned to see a woman dressed in long white robes with a stiff black veil over her head. I knew from the movies that she must be a nun, but I'd never seen such a person in real life. Sister showed me to my room, introducing me to my new roommate, Marilyn. After Sister left, the secretary told me to take out whatever essentials I'd need, because except for necessary personal items and my school uniform in the closet, she was taking the rest of my belongings away with her. I looked at her with all the venomous hatred I had stored inside of me, but I said nothing. Marilyn sat speechless on the edge of one of the beds. What is this place? I asked my new roommate. In the next few minutes, I found out that I was in a Catholic girls' school near Pasadena. After dinner, sister asked me to come into her private office. She closed the door, and we sat across from each other in two small chairs. I waited for her to speak. In a soft voice, she told me what the rules were to be for me here. My mother had told her that I was very difficult to handle and that I had gotten into trouble at my former school. Mother had requested that I receive very strict discipline and not be allowed any privileges. Sister said that meant that I would not be allowed to leave the school or to use the phone to make outside calls. I was to receive no mail, no visitors, and no incoming calls. It would not be possible for me to send any letters to anyone but my mother. In addition, I was not allowed to have any money. There was a school store where I could charge up to $5 per month for toothpaste, shampoo, or school supplies, and that was all. As I listened to Sister, it became clear to me that I was being held prisoner. Since no one from Chadwick knew where I was, and I was not going to be allowed any communication with the outside world, I was a prisoner. My willpower and determination began to crumble. I couldn't hold it together any longer. I began to tell Sister what had happened to me during the past week. As it unfolded, I saw the expression on her face change. I was sure she wouldn't believe me. Why should she? So I gave her the Chadwick's telephone number and begged her to call them. Sister did call the Chadwick's in a few days. She said that no matter what the truth was, it wouldn't change the restrictions Mother had placed on me. As for me, something had broken, and I just cried uncontrollably. I cried through morning prayers, through religion class, through lunch, and on into the afternoon. Sometimes I tried to stop crying, but it was too much effort. I'd given up being embarrassed about the other girls looking at me. Who cared? During the day, I took a seat in the back row of the class and cried. I have no idea what the nuns talked about, nor did it seem important. I turned in no papers, did no assignment, spoke to as few people as possible. After four weeks of continual crying, it was time for Christmas vacation. I knew I wasn't going anywhere. I knew that I was a prisoner in this strange, dreadful place where I didn't understand the people or the religion or the prayers or the talk about hell, sin, and damnation. I felt as though I'd been thrust through a time machine back into the Middle Ages. It was cold on top of that mountain. The winter rains came early that year. It was gray drizzle outside and damp dreariness inside. I had no more fight left, no more anger, no more spirit of survival. 
my entire life built over the last five years of pain, of determination, and finally of success, had suddenly been wrenched away from me. I had cried my eyes and my heart out for a month, and I was exhausted by the sheer onslaught of so much sorrow. My eyes had no more tears, my body had no more strength. I was worn out with the years of doing battle and ending up nowhere. I was drained of the last shred of hope. Everything I held valuable, everyone I loved, every bit of success was gone. It was all gone. It was all gone. I lay in bed, vaguely hearing the rain outside, and slowly felt myself slipping away. I was too tired to think any more, too tired to move. I was overcome with total exhaustion. The world faded away from me, and I sank into kind of a limbo world where nothing hurt. If I lay very still and kept my eyes closed, it didn't hurt any more. Everything was muffled. The world was at a distance from me. Time slipped away unnoticed. Day melted into night, melted into day again, and it was all the same. At some point I was dimly aware of Sister trying to talk to me. Her face floated above me, swathed in white, with a black halo shimmering above it. I closed my eyes again, and the floating face with the black halo disappeared like magic. Once or twice in the total darkness, I got up and went to the bathroom. I noticed a small tray of food by my bed and stared at it curiously. I had no feeling of hunger. I didn't care anymore. I wanted to die. I lost all desire to think. I just sank away into a peaceful, floating place where there were no harsh voices. There was no pain. There was no terror. It was very nice here, very quiet, very peaceful. Nothing hurt me any more. was all very far away, soft and muffled. Once, when I opened my eyes in the dark, I saw a stack of envelopes on a small table next to my bed. Christmas cards. Christmas cards. Christmas card lists. I sank away again, never touching the envelopes. Time, people, voices meant nothing. Nothing could touch me here. I didn't care any more. I melted into the darkness and floated through the empty space. I didn't dream. I didn't think. I heard my own breathing and floated on the rise and fall of the air. The white faces and black halos gathered around me from time to time. I dimly heard the heavy black wooden rosary beads rattling as the litany of their prayers wafted across the bed. Then the black halos drifted away into the rain. One day, I felt hungry. I had to rest several times before I was able to reach the dining room. A nun came out of the kitchen and looked at me as though she were seeing a ghost. A younger nun quickly assisted me back to bed, assuring me she would return immediately with some food. I was so weak that she had to feed me. I fell asleep. When I awoke, Sister was sitting on the edge of the bed saying her rosary. I looked at her and tried to manage a smile. When she realized that I actually recognized her, tears welled up in her eyes. She took my limp hand in hers and said, We've been praying for you. Thank you, sister. Most of the cards and letters stacked beside my bed were from friends of mine at Chadwick. I don't know how they found me, but most expressed love and sadness at the terrible circumstances surrounding my sudden departure. I sat on the edge of the bed, sobbing, with loneliness and despair. On May 10, 1955, Joan Crawford married a man by the name of Alfred N. Steele in Las Vegas, Nevada. At my school on a mountaintop near Pasadena, I heard about the marriage for the first time over a radio news broadcast. In his school, somewhere else in Los Angeles, my brother also learned of the marriage over the radio. Since none of the broadcasts mentioned the newlyweds' location, it was several days before I was able to reach Mother, though I left messages with the secretary at home. Mother didn't call me back. I kept calling her until I found her at home again. The instant I heard her voice, I could have strangled her. She was arrogant, pompous, condescending, and every inch the consummate bitch. She inquired why it had taken me so long to congratulate her. 
I told her the radio hadn't given any location and I'd left messages with the secretary. Then she said something that is emblazoned on my memory forever. Christina, all you had to do was call Las Vegas. The whole world knows who I am. Obviously, you didn't try very hard. Hundreds of other people found us. Fine, I said, shaking violently from head to foot. I hope you're both very happy. I hung up. I pounded my fist against the wall. She was despicable. It was useless. I did not speak to my mother for several months. I didn't bother calling her again, and she didn't phone me at school. Mr. Steele took her to Europe on their honeymoon. Unlike Chadwick, Flintridge Sacred Heart Academy had no summer school program. I had several invitations to spend time in friends' homes and ask Sister to ask Mother's permission. Sister received this letter in reply, mailed from Rome. Dear Sister, thank you so much for your sweet letter. I would rather Christina stay at school since she cannot behave at home. I have no assurance that she would behave when a visitor. It will do her good to have time alone when you are all in retreat, to be alone instead of having someone to show off to. It will give her thinking time, which she needs. She never ever says love in her letters to me, but to other people she says, My love always to your dear mother, knowing I will read the letters. Thank you oh so much for your kind helpfulness. I would like Tina to remain with you till she graduates. Thank you, Joan Crawford. I had been at Flintridge for seven months. During that time I had not seen mother, not set foot off campus. I continued to be punished severely, denied normal school privileges, and virtually locked up. Even though my report card was excellent and I had been elected student body vice president for my senior year, it was excruciating for me. There didn't seem to be any connection, any relationship between what I did and what I got. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how long I worked, it didn't seem to be enough to get me out of this everlasting punishment didn't make any sense anymore. She held all the cards. Her will be done. If I'd had a notion of loneliness before, it was nothing compared with this summer. I was so lonely I felt hollow. The office telephone sounded like a cannon. The closest thing to companionship I had was food. It was the one and only source of anything even remotely resembling pleasure. I was so unbelievably alone that I wondered if I was going to lose my mind. I thought about prisoners locked away in solitary confinement and marveled that they retained the will to live at all. I thought about hermits and the mountain men of the Old West and wondered if they too battled the enticing seductress of insanity. I now knew how people went mad. They gave up fighting. They went mad because it was a hell of a lot easier. They went mad because it comes to be a far better place than dying from the slow pain of loneliness. You just ease into being crazy. It doesn't happen overnight. You get tired of the constant battle with no victories. You become exhausted hoping for the ceasefire. You lose your grip on the world slowly and drift into the chasm of your own hopelessness. You have no mirror in which to confirm your own being. The now of your grief stretches endlessly into the future. No hope, no relief, no rewards, no change, ever. During that summer, I stood shakily on the tightrope of my lonely self. Each time I wavered, I saw below me the pit of madness, beckoning me to join the other lost souls who had given up the fight and slipped into a special world. It was a terrifying journey. I was the solitary traveler, somewhere during each day, suspended just above the beckoning chasm, hovering unsteadily, feeling my grip slipping. I was sixteen years old.